It is a pleasure and a privilege uh, to be able to open uh, this session for the lecture and Q&A uh, by uh, Hiroshi Nakasu, the, one of the deputy governors of the Bank of Japan. I've known him for, for quite a while. I was very briefly a central banker myself, although it, it never got serious. Um, um, uh, Mr. Uh, Nakaso has been with the Bank of Japan since 78. He has a long and distinguished career. Um, he um, has served as uh, executive director and head of international operations at the bank until uh, March of 2013. And he worked as director general of the financial markets department and um, financial markets department chief since uh, May 2003. He's also in charge of the Monetary Affairs Department and Businesses at the Institute for Monetary and Economic Studies, an affiliate of the Bank of Japan where the thinking takes place. He's just the doing and the thinking. Very unusual among central bankers. Um, um, uh, finally, um, uh, not, uh, but not least, uh, Mr. Nakasa appears in Jillian Ted's book, Fool's Gold, uh, as a Japanese central banker who actually predicted the global uh, the global financial crisis a year before Lehman uh, collapsed. And he's quoted to have said, and I'm quoting, probably you will have to be prepared for more events to come. The crisis management skills of central banks and financial authorities will be tested in the months ahead. Was he ever right? His prediction is based, of course, on his extensive experience of having dealt with Japan's own financial crisis in the 1990s. He was uh, involved in the resolution and addressing of most of the bank crisis and bank failures that took place during the decade. Uh, in the great financial crisis, he headed the financial markets department, which was described by the foreign media as, quote, Fortress Japan, which carried out operations to prevent the spillovers from overseas, uh, especially from the uh, United States and Western Europe, negatively affecting Japan's financial system. And so his experience of this crisis, right from 1990 on, uh, uh, naturally reflected in his views on the economy and the monetary policy. He brings unique wisdom and experience uh, to this subject, and I'm very much looking forward to learning from him. Thank you, Mr. Nakasso. So, um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is my uh, great uh, honor to have this opportunity to give a presentation at uh, the Japan Society. Um, looking back uh, at my central banking career has been introduced. Um, my career was devoted to dealing with the economic and financial problems that have unfolded uh, since the burst of Japan's asset bubbles more than two decades ago. Um, I have become uh, more and more uh, determined to overcome deflation during uh, uh, this process. At the same time, I'm aware more than ever of the importance of raising Japan's growth potential. And this is a topic I would like to talk about today. <clears throat> uh, raising the growth potential is an issue that I believe is of uh, relevance not only for Japan, but also for other industrialized nations. Uh, since Japan's experience of uh, decelerating trend, growth is a potential precursor of uh, things to come elsewhere. Uh, in fact, uh, Japan's experience provides a good case study uh, of the issues that need to be tackled. Uh, so in the following session, I would like to talk about how to address the challenges of uh, low trend growth, uh, paying particular attention to relationship between demand stimulus and supply side reforms. Uh, then I'll try to assess how much progress Japan has made so far. Now, uh, some of you uh, may uh, be asking, what about the negative policy, monetary policy. Don't worry. Um, <laughs> I, am, I am going to speak about uh, monetary policy. Now, in my presentation uh, uh, today, uh, please allow me uh, to be a bit technical uh, uh, um, on, on some of the issues. But I thought it was nonetheless important to, to let you have a clearer view. So allow me. So let me start with the brief overview of Japan's growth potential. Uh, <clears throat> Japan has continued to struggle with slower trend growth. And the, the Bank of Japan estimates that Japan's potential growth has uh, fallen, from, uh, fallen to as low as half percent or even slightly lower. 
given such a low potential growth rate, even a small negative shock or uh, simply statistical noise can uh, tip Japan's measured GDP growth rate into negative territory. Um, this is, uh, seen, uh, as you can see on this slide, uh, uh, the trend growth can be decomposed into growth in labor input and growth in labor productivity. And as is well known, uh, both factors are responsible for the decline in Japan's slowing uh, growth trend. Now, will this uh, trend continue? Uh, if so, what can be done? Uh, to give you a sense of the challenge, let me show you some uh, calculations on uh, how, how the 2% growth, 2 growth, which is the Japanese government uh, is aiming at, uh, how that can be achieved. Now, this table shows two alternative scenarios uh, based on uh, different assumptions uh, regarding labor participation. Um, the first is, this is something you can see on, on, on the right, uh, I mean, in the center of the table. The first uh, scenario is the so-called uh, status quo scenario, uh, where things remain unchanged. And the other, thing, other, other is the optimistic scenario, which is based on two assumptions. First, uh, it is assumed that uh, the female labor participation rate in Japan rises to the level observed in Sweden. Second, uh, it is assumed that all healthy elderly will continue working irrespective of the retirement age. Uh, for instance, um, reflecting Japan's rising life expectancy, 60% uh, of 80 to 84 years old in Japan say that uh, they are healthy enough to go about their daily lives. So we assume that in this scenario that all of these elderly continue to work. Uh, setting aside how realistic uh, they are, um, these assumptions mean that the labor force can be expected to increase uh, about uh, half percent per year. However, uh, uh, to achieve 2% GDP growth, uh, labor productivity still needs to rise uh, by about 1.5% uh, per year in this uh, optimistic scenario. Now, that being said, in the status quo scenario, uh, labor input shrinks by almost 1% per year, so that uh, labor productivity would have to go uh, grow by a hefty uh, 3% to achieve the 2% uh, GDP growth target. Now, in the optimistic scenario, the productivity growth of 1.5% required uh, uh, in this optimistic scenario would still be high, uh, both from a historical and international perspective but uh, it may not be unachievable, I think. Uh, economic theory suggests that key drivers of uh, growth are uh, productivity catch-up and growth at the technological frontier. Now, there is no doubt that the number of Japanese manufacturers are at this uh, uh, global technology frontier, but I think there remains ample room for uh, catch-up in many industries, particularly in the non-manufacturing sector. Uh, for example, it is often said that uh, Japanese firms, especially in the non-manufacturing uh, uh, sector, lag behind their foreign counterparts in the use of information technology, uh, primarily uh, due to underinvestment in this area and a shortage in related expertise. Um, as a result, uh, Japan's productivity level is about 35% uh, below that of the United States, which is often assumed to, be the repre to, to represent the world technology frontier. Uh, this is shown on the uh, left-hand side of the, uh, uh, the, the slide three. Now, during the, uh, the course of um, their course uh, of economic development, uh, countries tend to enjoy rapid growth during the period of uh, technological catch-up. Um, Japan had largely gone through this phase by the 1980s, so productivity growth uh, decelerated thereafter, as we have seen in the previous slide one. Uh, now, that being said, uh, 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 as seen in the right panel of slide three, in the period between 2000 and 2014, Japan enjoyed one of the highest uh, productivity growth rates among the G7 countries. Now, Probably this is because, of, uh, because there are still remains some room for catch up for Japan. Now, in any case, this uh, back of the envelope calculation underscores uh, the importance of labor productivity in raising the growth potential, particularly in an economy like Japan's, uh, with its demographic constraints, 
policies should have a clear focus on raising productivity growth. Now, what does this slower trend growth mean for uh, central bankers? First, um, slower trend growth, other things being equal, uh, implies a smaller output gap. Now, this is shown on this slide for, uh, this is simple arithmetic. Um, changes in the output gap equals changes in real GDP minus changes in potential output. Now, at the height of the 1997-98 banking crisis in Japan, uh, it was thought that Japan might fall into a deflationary spiral, like that uh, experienced by the United States during the uh, Great Depression in the um, 1930s. However, in the wake of the crisis, uh, even at its worst, Japan's CPI deflation rate did not substantially exceed minus 1%. Uh, with the effect of uh, benefit of hindsight, uh, the output gap was smaller, smaller than we had envisaged, uh, due to a decline in the potential growth. Uh, in fact, although um, I am afraid uh, I, I may uh, have to confuse you, the story actually is a bit more uh, complicated than I have just described. Uh, I will later argue that slower trend growth may worsen the output gap, as other things may not be equal. The second corollary of slower trend growth for central bankers is that it implies a lower equilibrium real interest rate or natural rate of interest. Uh, this is shown in, in, in red solid line on this chart. Uh, 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 the, the, red shine, the red line shows this uh, equilibrium rate. Now, the equilibrium real interest rate is the real interest rate that would prevail at full employment and inflation at a targeted level, and thus provides a reference point for the policy uh, interest rate. Now, economic theory suggests that slower trend growth leads to a lower equilibrium real interest rate. So presented with a lower equilibrium interest rate, a central bank unless it faces a zero or lower bound, uh, needs to cut its policy rate if it wants to maintain monetary stimulus at the uh, prevailing, prevailing level. Now, recently, the decline in the equilibrium interest rate has been a hot, uh, hot, hotly debated topic, not only in Japan, but also in the other industrial economies, including, of course, here in the United States. Uh, the debate was, as you probably know, initiated by Larry Summers, uh, who, po who uh, put forward the so-called secular stagnation hypothesis. Uh, the focus of the discussion among scholars, policymakers, and uh, commentators is A, whether the lower equilibrium real interest rate is a permanent phenomenon. B, what its causes are. Uh, slower trend growth undoubtedly is one important factor, but there may be other explanations, such as a change in saving investment uh, preferences. C, how to cope with a lower equilibrium interest rate, given that uh, nominal policy interest rates have already hit that zero lower bound in many advanced economies. Now, uh, due to uh, time constraints, I will not cover all of these uh, questions today. Instead, uh, let me focus on, on, on possible policy measures under these circumstances. Uh, linked to the second issue, the causes of lower equilibrium interest rate, uh, there is an ongoing debate uh, regarding uh, whether demand stimulus or supply side reforms are more relevant to counter the possible uh, secular stagnation. On the one hand, those who attribute the lower natural rate of interest to excess saving uh, advocate more demand stimulus through monetary and or fiscal policy. On the other hand, those who argue that potential growth has declined because of a deterioration in supply side factors tend to stress the importance of structural reforms, including uh, deregulation and educational reforms. My answer, my answer to what kind of policies are needed is that both monetary, policy, monetary and fiscal policies and structural reforms are indispensable. Both of them are important which is, I think, in the spirit of the joint statement of the Bank of Japan and the Japanese government issued in January 2013, 
Now, I think there are three reasons underpinning my answer. First, from a practitioner's uh, point of view, uh, we cannot wait uh, for the day when this academic debate is settled. If both demand stimulus and supply side reforms are potentially important, uh, I would say, why not try both? Uh, we need to dispense all the medicine that might work for the patient. Secondly, if, 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 if supply side reforms incur short term pain, at least part of that pain needs to be alleviated through demand measures. Um, for, for instance, labor market reforms temporarily uh, raise the unemployment rate. And if that's the case, it is quite sensible to stimulate demand to smooth the transition uh, through those reforms. Third, I think that uh, from a theoretical perspective, the distinction between demand and supply side measures is quite blurred. For example, supply side reforms raise potential growth and reduce uncertainty about the future. So, so that firms and households spend more today in anticipation of higher uh, profits and incomes in the future, thus raising current demand. On the other hand, demand stimulus such as uh, monetary policy easing raises uh, potential output uh, through an increase in the capital stock as well as labor input, thus affecting the supply side as well. Now, <clears throat> This uh, difficulty in separating demand and supply side aspects uh, also applies when um, examining the causes of the decline in the equilibrium interest rate. For example, uh, both the demand side, both the demand and supply side camps argue that demography, which is uh, lower uh, negative population growth and population aging, play a role in lowering uh, the natural rate of interest. Now, from a supply side perspective, a decline in growth rate of the working age population lowers the growth potential of the economy, and that's the natural rate of interest. On the other hand, from a demand side perspective, the aging of the population reduces uh, uh, the population share of younger generations, and since younger generations tend to borrow more heavily than uh, older generations, a drop in the share results in a decline in the natural rate of interest through a decline in loan demand. So I uh, sometimes feel that this, is, this difficulty to distinguish between supply and demand side factors goes beyond the issue at hand and may shake up uh, conventional ways of thinking in other fields of economics, such as the clear distinction between growth and business cycle models. Uh, broadly speaking, Business cycle models, which deal with how, to, how, how the output gap is determined, assume that the trend growth is exogenously given. On the other hand, growth models, which is, uh, examine the evolution of this trend growth, omit the output gap. This division of labor between standard models makes it difficult for economists to uh, consider the interactions between the output gap and trend growth. Well, and in, in any, any event, all these uh, considerations lead to a conclusion that demand stimulus and supply side reforms are complements rather than substitutes. It is for this reason that I believe that monetary policy to overcome deflation and supply side reforms to raise growth potential must be pursued in tandem to bring Japan's economy back on track to sustained growth. I am a firm believer that at this uh, critical juncture, the Bank of Japan needs to provide support to the economy by pursuing its inflation targeting policy. Monetary policy needs to remain lax, and in fact is lax. Uh, this is uh, again illustrated in slide five, which shows that under the uh, quantitative and qualitative monetary easing, the Bank of Japan is keeping the real interest rate well below the natural uh, rate of interest. That is, towards the right end of the chart, you see that red line, I mean the dotted blue line is well below the natural rate of interest uh, expressed in red line. So this gives you the, um, the magnitude of the stimulus coming from easy monetary policy. <laughs> however, however, I also agree with uh, former Chairman Bernanke that the monetary policy is not a panacea. In light of recent developments in growth theory and, uh, and other fields, I do believe that institutions or systems matter. Um, what is needed in an institutional framework, uh, 
uh, that fosters innovation to push up technology frontier and raise productivity. Although, as, uh, I, although I said that uh, catching up is still important for Japan, in the end, the ultimate engine for growth is innovation. And uh, institutional framework, and by institutional framework, here I mean not only economic institutions, but also other aspects of society, such as uh, the legal system, education, and so on. Against this background, um, uh, I strongly hope and believe that the Japanese government will pay, play its role in providing such a framework by continuing with structural reforms. The question that naturally arises uh, is how much progress Japan has made in addressing the challenges facing its economy. My uh, short answer uh, is that there is some progress, but not enough. In fact, uh, there is one area uh, which good progress has been made, uh, which is raising the labor participation rates of young women and elderly, uh, which have increased to exceed the corresponding rates in the United States, as, uh, as, as you can see on this uh, slide. Um, however, uh, based mainly on the following three observations, I think that overall, that glass remains half empty. Um, all three observations, which means uh, concerning uh, potential growth, growth expectations, and wage growth, uh, suggest that productivity growth is still not sufficiently high. Three reasons. First, uh, potential growth has not sufficiently increased. As we have seen in slide, uh, previous slide five, the Bank of Japan estimates that potential growth remains around slightly below half percent. It is well known that uh, real-time uh, estimates of the potential growth rate are fraught with great uncertainty, and it is often after a considerable time lag that we can recognize changes in potential growth. Uh, for example, uh, assuming that Japan continues to follow a steady growth path, it is well possible that uh, we may find in, in, in hindsight that Japan's growth potential has actually already increased a bit although I, I doubt that it has reached a level of 2 percent. Second, uh, Japanese firms have uh, continued to hoard huge savings. It is true that Japanese firms, backed by record uh, profits, have recently started to increase fixed investment, which, according to our Tankan, December Tankan survey, will increase by about 8.5 percent this fiscal year. However, it, if we look at the saving investment balance of the corporate sector, in April, September last year, saving continues to exceed investment by more than 15 trillion yen, or about 6.5% six six of GDP, as shown in the left-hand uh, hand panel of this slide. In contrast, until the early 90s, uh, corporate investment uh, used to exceed corporate saving. Now, uh, there may be a variety of uh, reasons why Japanese firms keep saving. Uh, for instance, given the volatility of financial markets observed in recent times, um, uh, <clears throat> firms may prefer to retain liquidity against the backdrop of perceived higher uncertainty in the economy. Um, they may also try to pile up cash as a precaution due to lingering memories of the financial crisis in the past. However, it seems to me that the main reason behind the large savings uh, surplus is the fact that firms' growth expectations, growth expectations have not sufficiently improved, as shown in the uh, right-hand panel of this slide. The subdued growth expectations, in turn, will retain productivity growth, um, restrain uh, productivity growth in the future as a result of insufficient capital uh, deepening. Third, uh, nominal wages have not risen fast enough. Recently, nominal wages have been increasing by about half percent on a year-on basis. Now, this is a big change from the situation a couple of years ago when nominal wages uh, uh, were declining at a rate of about one and a half, per, uh, one and a half uh, percent. However, wage increases are still failing to catch up with inflation and remain well below the bank's uh, two percent inflation target. Uh, the sluggish increase in the nominal wages is thought to reflect uh, low productivity growth and the strong deflationary mindset, since, in the long run, 
nominal wage growth should equal productivity growth plus inflation. Again, uh, these developments suggest, support the view uh, that sustained improvements in productivity are necessary to maintain the economic growth momentum. Um, in this regard, the current spring wage negotiations, or shunto in Japanese, are critically important. Um, I think it is too early to tell the outcome at this stage, and the picture is mixed. Since faster wage increases are indispensable for a steady uh, consumption growth and higher inflation, we are now carefully monitoring how the negotiations uh, unfold. So structural reforms have been uh, steadily moving forward, but it will uh, nonetheless take time until such reforms uh, boost the potential growth rate. In a, country like, uh, in a country where the natural rate of interest has declined, the central bank has to implement a monetary policy based on that lower rate. As I explained earlier, uh, monetary easing means achieving a real interest rate that is lower than the natural rate of interest. In pursuing monetary policy in Japan, the challenges resulting from the decline in the natural interest rate had been compounded by the increasing difficulties in lowering real interest rates. Uh, these difficulties reflected the fact that nominal interest rates at the shorter end of the yield curve had already been subject to significant downward pressure, and we were already facing the zero lower bound, while inflation expectation had faded. Uh, in order to tackle this kind of um, suboptimal situation, the Bank of Japan uh, judged it necessary to lower the real interest rate by shoring up inflation expectations and at the same time seeking room for further decline in nominal interest rates. Um, quantitative and qualitative monetary easing, the QQE, which the Bank of Japan launched in April 2013, provided a major breakthrough uh, in these uh, two dimensions. The main transmission mechanism that QQE envisages is twofold. The first is to convert people's deflationary mindset and raise their inflation expectations through strong commitment toward achieving the price stability target of 2%. The second is to encourage nominal rate interest rate to decline further across the entire yield curve through large-scale purchases of JGBs, the Japanese government bonds. Together, uh, these uh, two mechanisms have if, uh, the effect of uh, pushing real interest rate uh, down further. Um, I think the QQE has produced its intended effects. Uh, the decline in, in real interest rates has uh, stimulated private sector demand and has brought about record profits at firms and full employment in labor market. Moreover, the underlying trend in inflation has been steadily improving. Uh, the annual rate of change in the CPI, excluding uh, fresh food and energy, um, these are items subject to large uh, price fluctuations, um, has remained, this CPI remained positive for 27 consecutive months and recently climbed to 1.3%. Now, looking ahead, the baseline scenario assumes that Japan's economy is likely to be on a moderate expanding uh, trend and the annual rate of change in the CPI is expected to revert to an upward uh, uh, trend towards the uh, price stability target of 2%. Um, now, the Bank of Japan recently took further actions to strengthen monetary easing by adding a negative interest rate dimension to QQE. Uh, the decision was taken against the backdrop of a volatile global financial market, reflecting the further slide in uh, crude oil prices and growing uncertainty over the outlook for emerging and commodity exporting economies. We judged there was a, an increasing risk that the improvement in business confidence could be undermined and the conversion of people's deflationary mindset be delayed. Consequently, we were worried that this would negatively affect the underlying trend in inflation. So uh, in order to preempt the manifestation of this kind of risk and maintain the momentum toward achieving the price stability target, we uh, judged that it was necessary to further strengthen monetary easing at this juncture. 
Um, in introducing QQE with a negative interest rate, we focused on two points. First, the introduction of a negative interest rate is an additional element that le uh, leaves the basic framework of QQE intact. That is, the bank will continue to push down the entire yield curve through large-scale purchases of JGB under QQE. In addition, it aims to create even more powerful easing effects by lowering the short end of the yield curve through the introduction of negative interest rate policy, as you can see on this slide. The quantitative easing and the negative interest rate are therefore not inconsistent, but instead uh, complement each other. In uh, de designing the policy, uh, we, uh, we uh, benefited a great deal from uh, the wisdom and experiences uh, of those central banks in Europe that have adopted a negative interest rate policy. Um, simply transplanting the policy from them, however, was, not, was out of the question since Japan's idiosyncratic circumstances need to be taken into account. Uh, specifically, in Japan, reserves at the central bank are far larger in Europe, and under QQE will continue to increase at an annual pace of around 80 trillion yen. Um, to address the concern that a negative interest rate might impose an excessive burden on financial institutions and have an adverse effect on the functioning of financial intermediation, we adopted a multi-tier, multiple-tier system so that a negative interest rate is applied only to the marginal increase in excess reserve. And this portion is expressed in, in, in pink uh, on this chart. Now, I think this is a unique feature of our policy framework. The second important aspect of QQE with a negative interest rate is that it aims to provide scope for further monetary easing in terms of the interest rate dimension, in addition to the quantity and quality dimensions. Uh, if judged necessary, uh, we are ready to take further actions in terms of quantity and quality, and we do not share the view that the bank, uh, bank's asset purchases are approaching their limit. Uh, to further supplement these tools, the new policy adds an uh, interest rate option to these two existing options so that the bank can now pursue additional monetary easing measures in terms of three dimensions, quantity, quality, and a negative interest rate. The new policy framework will provide significant reinforcement to uh, complete our mission to overcome deflation. Our monetary policy initiatives will also contribute to uh, shoring up the potential growth rate. The bank aims at providing accommodative financial conditions and dispelling people's persistent, uh, persistent deflationary mindset by pursuing QQE with negative interest rate. We believe it will contribute to creating a business environment that encourages firms to pursue more proactive investment strategies and make greater efforts to improve productivity. If all economic entities fully take advantage of this extremely favorable environment, this should help improve the potential growth rate. I uh, fully uh, expect this will happen. Ladies and gentlemen, let me now conclude. Japan needs to raise the trend growth of the economy. This is necessary not only for the sake of the current generation, but also to ensure the future generation can enjoy decent life with a sense of hope and security. To that end, we need to utilize both demand and supply side measures uh, to the greatest possible extent. Now that the Bank of Japan has taken monetary easing one step farther at the end of the last month, I think that the original third arrow of Abenomics, the growth strategy, must also fly faster. The challenges ahead are formidable, but it is time now to deliver results no matter how difficult the challenges are. I hope that by doing so, Japan sets an example for other countries similarly facing a decline in trend growth. I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. That was uh, really fascinating. Um, I will um, abuse the, uh, uh, pa the position of the moderator that's what I'm called, actually. Few, few people would actually call me a moderator, more an immoderator. But yes, uh, um, uh, by asking you a couple of questions and then opening it up to the audience, who undoubtedly are 
very keen to ask you um, both about uh, the um, longer-term problem, medium-term problem of uh, raising Japan's growth rate to uh, something well above the very modest 0.4 or whatever it is now, and about the, uh, the financial crisis that appears to be um, uh, threatening us again, and of which we have you know, sensed uh, uh, quite a bit uh, since uh, Japan lowered rates into negative territory um, on, uh, on the 28th. I believe, uh, you, Mr. Deputy Governor, uh, voted in favor of going <laughs> negative. It was yes. a five to four <laughs> vote, it was close. Uh, and um, uh, do you think this contributed to the recent turbulence in the global financial market, or are there other drivers? And how worried should we be about it? Do policymakers, monetary policymakers especially, still have the tools to address turbulence in global financial markets? Thank you uh, very much. Um, the first part of your question was probably on, on how I see the global market turbulence. Yes. Um, well, I disregard, um, I, I think investors are becoming excessively risk averse globally, uh, maybe against the uh, backdrop of uh, growing uncertainties over the outlook for the Chinese economy, exacerbated by further slide in oil prices. Uh, this is why uh, we think global stock markets see falling prices and the yen exchange rate uh, appreciated rather rapidly. Um, now, uh, we'll, we'll be watching with utmost care, of course, uh, how the uh, developments in the global financial markets are going to affect Japan's economy and inflation. With regard to uh, what we have tools, I think we have tools. Um, um, but this is something uh, uh, we have to uh, 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 be closely in touch with uh, our counterparts, uh, overseas counterparts, which means overseas authorities. And in fact, uh, we are uh, exchanging uh, views and information uh, in various aspects, just as we have uh, always done in the past. Thank you very much. Um, one of the uh, reasons behind the real hammering of uh, bank stocks <laughs> in markets over the uh, past week or so uh, has been the fear that negative rates, such as the one set by the BOJ, would have an adverse impact on, on banks' earnings. Uh, are you concerned about that? Uh, I can see that your C-tier system might limit the pain, but it doesn't quite take it away. Okay, um, I think this is a good opportunity to, to explain this uh, tier system, <laughs> um, which uh, is, may not be fully understood by um, um, uh, the people in the market. So if I may, uh, let me uh, uh, try to explain. Um, this is the three-tier system. And uh, the basic balance here, uh, uh, in, uh, this represents the, the portion of excess reserves that had been built up under the QQE. Uh, the outstanding will be fixed at the average outstanding uh, for 2015, and on which, as you can see, 10 basis positive interest rate will still be paid. Now, this portion will be initially 210 trillion yen, 210. Now, the, 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 the policy rate balance um, uh, uh, is the marginal tier of reserves to which a uh, negative rate of 10 basis is applied. Um, now, this is the, the, the mechanism that drives the market interest rate down, because any incremental uh, transaction that accompanies a corresponding increase uh, in the amount of uh, reserves will bear the cost of negative 10 basis. So it is therefore the negative 10 basis on this uh, marginal portion uh, uh, that affects the pricing of any new financial transactions in the market. Now, this portion is uh, expected to be around 10 trillion yen initially. The intermediate portion here, uh, which we call the macro add-on balance, 
um, uh, uh, to which a 0% interest rate will be applied. The outstanding of this balance will be uh, uh, um, around 40 trillion yen initially. It will there be thereafter be reviewed from time to time so as to ensure that uh, there remains certain amount of this uh, policy rate balance with negative rates. Uh, under the current uh, QQE guideline for monetary operations, the monetary base will grow at a pace of 80 trillion yen annually. This means if we decide the corresponding increase in the macro add-ons, this portion to increase uh, uh, um, 80 trillion per year or quarterly increases of 20 trillion, it would imply that uh, the outstanding of uh, policy rate balance would remain unchanged. Uh, basically at 10 trillion yen. Well, of course, you have to be that more precise. Uh, this portion fluctuates, uh, of course, uh, from time to time, depending on the market conditions. So therefore, um, we assume uh, the policy rate balance will move in the range of 10 to 30 trillion yen. Mm -hmm. um, in any case, this one's 210, this one's 40, now almost in 10 to 30. So it's a very small portion out of uh, the entire uh, reserves to which the negative rates are applied. <coughs> so uh, this portion would uh, remain relatively small to the total reserve outstanding. Uh, the numbers uh, I have mentioned, by the way, are preliminary and might change, but this is a general, general idea. So on your uh, question of, uh, 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 on, on bank profitability, um, uh, uh, we think uh, banks' intermediary function is so important that because it's a transmission mechanism, monetary policy. So uh, by imposing additional too heavy burden, uh, there is a risk of undermining the uh, 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 financial intermediary function, which we don't want to happen. So as I mentioned, this uh, uh, three-tier system uh, for the reserve, uh, reserve that the bank holds with the BOJ uh, this is um, <coughs> something that uh, uh, alleviates uh, 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 the, the uh, too big a burden on the on bank's profitability. Uh, in other words, this is system is carefully designed to mitigate a drastic impact on bank's profitability while ensuring the effect of negative rate on transaction prices uh, in financial markets. Because as I said, it w the, the, the average, although the, neg uh, the marginal rate will be uh, negative, uh, average interest rate paid on reserves would still remain positive. Uh, so this is a, 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 a mechanism to, to alleviate extra burden, uh, heavy burden on, on uh, banks' uh, uh, profitability. Um, so in this regard, as you mentioned, uh, we have seen a substantial drop in bank shares in the recent uh, um, 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 couple in the past couple of days, but I think this is a bit overdone in this regard. Um, of course, uh, back home in Japan, uh, we are talking with our bankers, and as, as I did over the lunch this time around too, um, um, to seek uh, their understanding that overcoming deflation is in everyone's interest, and that the introduction of negative interest rate is intended to um, accelerate the process towards that end. And this, in turn, would allow us to move back to a more or less nominal yield curve uh, sooner than otherwise. Um, may I just follow up on this uh, one small question and then throw it over to the audience? It's really part of the second question. You said that the marginal tranche, the um, uh, policy rate balance, is a negative rate. That's what drives the pricing of any new financial transactions mm -hmm. in the market. But does this also apply to new retail deposits by households, by SMEs, new residential mortgages. Are the banks going to be paying uh, the borrowers? Um, the, as an economist, I say, of course it would. But uh, there seem to be social, cultural almost obstacles to passing on, even on new transactions, negative rates to um, retail transactions. Uh, what is your view on both the desirability and the likelihood of that pass-through eventually taking mm -hmm. place? I think uh, the most tangible effects that we have already seen are the market transactions. Um, 
like uh, uh, we have see already seen a uh, substantial uh, 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 decline in the yield curve. Mm -hmm. So that has already taken place, uh, uh, more or less consistent with the theory that I have mentioned. Um, <clears throat> Now, on the question of uh, whether this is going to be applied to retail deposits, I think this uh, is uh, dependent on the bank management and uh, the social backgrounds, as you have mentioned. Uh, so uh, we still don't know in the sense that it's up to the bank's decision to make. But uh, from what I heard, uh, learned from our European uh, uh, peers, um, uh, at least uh, imposing uh, uh, negative interest rates on retail deposits is, is very unlikely. Uh, that's not happening uh, uh, on a wider basis. That was uh, 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 something we learned from the uh, our peers. Thank you very much. I will now throw it open to the public, yeah, the audience. Uh, anybody? There are two mics, one on your left, one on your right. If I see, I see a hand in the middle there, the uh, lady with the scarf, yes. Um, let me see. Of course, you would have to be in the middle, yes. So it takes the longest time to travel, but this is... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Hi, Mr. Nakaso. Nakaso, thank you so much for such an informative and illuminating presentation. I have a quick follow-on question to Mr. to this slide, which uh, I notice there are no figures on the left, and I understand the explanation you've given us on the macro side, but at the level of individual banks, as you said, these uh, tiers will be reviewed from time to time. Um, is there any concern you have about uh, the bank's inability to predict? their own funding costs because of these shifting tiers? Are you, do you have plans to be in very close communication with them? Yes, um, both. Um, first of all, our, I think the Japanese banks have very uh, well uh, 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 good skills in controlling the, the, uh, the, uh, the outstanding balance. Um, uh, 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 so using that skill, I think it will be very, um, um, not that uh, difficult at least uh, to, to to manage the, uh, 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 the outstanding of these reserves. Now, one thing I would like to add in this regard is the picture you see is a macro picture. And of course, it depends on individual banks. Uh, some banks may have uh, uh, more uh, 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 policy rate balance than others. Mm -hmm. And some banks would even have no uh, policy rate uh, balance only uh, uh, macro uh, uh, add-ons and uh, basic balance. Now, this is an intended kind of uh, policy effect uh, in the following way. Uh, we would like to retain a certain portion of um, uh, magnitude of market transactions. So if that is going to happen, uh, 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 introduce, I think there will be banks, uh, so there will be kind of uh, reallocation of reserves from those banks uh, that have uh, excess reserves to those banks uh, whose reserves, uh, who, who still have, let's say, capacity to build up reserves. And that, I think, will, to a certain degree, mm -hmm. uh, maintain uh, market transactions. So this is a kind of intended uh, 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 policy, thanks. Uh, gentleman in the front here, please. The mic is coming your way. Besides cash at, uh, at the BOJ, <coughs> Japanese banks, because of very lackluster loan demand, also own huge portfolios of Japanese government bonds, JGBs, which have basically, out, I guess, out to 10 years are, are, are more or less negative now. So they also face a risk on their reinvestment since they have these large portfolios and as their securities roll off, they'll either, I guess, have to reinvest in a JGB at negative or would that rate, those reserves then receive a negative rate? And is that a, an additional punitive measure that's concerning the markets now about profitability? Um, depends, I think, because uh, what we intend to do um, uh, with regard to the QQE uh, purchase operation is that unlike the ECBs, uh, we are prepared to buy uh, 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 from the market the GBs uh, with uh, lower uh, negative rates lower than 10 basis, which means a higher price. Uh, um, so that uh, if a bank can uh, sell uh, the JGB to um, uh, 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 BOJ with a deeper negative interest rate than 10 basis, they can still uh, earn some earnings. Mm -hmm. So it d doesn't really uh, squeeze your profitability, not necessarily. Thank you. 
the lady in the middle here. Yes, thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Lisa Tellum from Flower District Companies. I want to thank you both. First of all, I'm a beneficiary of your organization's work. I was in the JET program as a young woman. So thank you to the Japanese government for your forward thinking cross-cultural education. I worked in Osaka and I am a former city banker from global mergers and acquisitions. So I suppose my question is somewhat loaded. <laughs> <laughs> you, I, I agree with the theme on the cultural and the social barriers and the need to get more proactive high conviction management and basically unlock all this capital. How do you each think about the balance of trade and moving investment out of Japan and or into Japan to accomplish your goals from the perspective of the Japanese government? or at least from your agency? Um, I think there are, there are, there are multiple ways. I mean, um, many measures, different measures should be combined uh, to achieve the kind of effect that, uh, that uh, you suggested. Um, <clears throat> now, in this regard, um, things like uh, TPP is very productive. I think it's a significant step forward. Uh, I think it is an important pillar of uh, the so-called growth strategy. So that we, we welcome this achievement by the government. Um, <clears throat> now, I think also uh, from what we saw in the past uh, few years, uh, uh, the, it is very important to have a stable exchange rate. Um, I say this because many of those uh, companies uh, 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 which shifted production sites outside Japan in the aftermath of Lehman collapse, when the exchange rate, our exchange rate appreciated substantially, um, <clears throat> this resulted in loss of course uh, uh, capex uh, inside Japan. Now, after that, after two, uh, two or three years, two, two or three years after that, um, uh, or even later, uh, when the exchange rate is started to, uh, uh, um, of course, stabilize at a, 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 a weaker level. Um, but the stabilization, I think, is probably more important. Uh, many companies have decided to come back to some extent. And that is uh, stimulating domestic uh, uh, investment uh, in the areas like uh, R&D uh, or mother factories. So um, again, uh, a stable, stable macro fundamentals I think is a key to uh, 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 encourage this kind of um, proactive uh, investment. Yeah. I think the brief, uh, if I may just come in on that, since it was partly addressed at me, uh, Japan has 80% of its economy in services. Uh, at levels of productivity, because of over-regulation, lack of competition, lack of FDI, way below the US, and even the US isn't best practice in all services. So if you opened up, deregulated, brought in FDI, you could get, given time, given investment, and given a bit of immigration, right, a 40% boost in GDP in Japan, simply by moving the service sector, 35 to 40, uh, to the frontier. So th and there would be massive investment opportunities there. So it's all there, but it's such supply side policies that uh, Mr. Nakasa so rightly emphasized. Monetary yeah. policy can't do this. Um, uh, there's a question at the back there uh, on the, yes, thank you. And there's one on the right there, yes. yes, yes, yes. That'll be the next one. Yeah. Okay, so for, for your presentation is very, very uh, illuminating. Uh, it's Brian Kelly with Asian Century Quest. You indicated that you're, you're hopeful that by, by moving rates negative, you can incent the private sector to be more aggressive in, in investment as one of your objectives. And in one of your earlier slides, as you rightly point out, nearly 6% of GDP is accruing on a flow basis each year in incremental corporate savings. So this is not a stock number, this is a flow number. Every year, 6% of GDP is being saved by the private sector. Now, the private sector is either households or companies, but we know that households themselves aren't really saving any money anymore as people have aged and they're drawing down their savings. So almost all this money is coming from private non-financial companies. 
Now again, as you point out, it's a small change to get to negative 10 basis points. But you've got 600 basis points of GDP on a flow basis that's accruing to the corporates and they're not spending that money. So this type of macro policy, obviously, from the Bank of Japan, is, you know, has the right intentions. But if there were more fiscal policies that were adopted to incent greater monetary velocity in the form of forcing corporates to either pay out this, this money in excess wages or perhaps in buying back their shares, improving their own capital efficiency, which as you know is the counterpart to labor efficiency that you pointed out in your presentation, that would be a wonderful compliment to the hard work that the BOJ is, uh -huh. is, is trying to achieve here. Could you give us the bank's view on that topic? Well, this was a kind of um, uh, underlying topic uh, in my presentation uh, in the sense that both are important. Uh, monetary policy, by the introduction of this new uh, negative rate, I, I think you know the trans, uh, we are now uh, the, the, the intended uh, transmission mechanism remains the same uh, from under the QQE in the sense that what we're trying to do is to lower the real interest rate relative to nominal rates, and this uh, uh, one uh, negative rate is going to reinforce this kind of mechanism. So it provides, it should provide the industry with a wonderful, uh, 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 favorable environment to invest. Now, the, the, but this is necessary condition, as I said, uh, tr uh, as I tried to su suggest in my presentation. It has to be combined. Uh, policies in tandem must be pursued, particularly from the uh, structural side, as I said. Um, 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 that in a kind of a general uh, uh, remarks, uh, general expression, to raise the gross expectations on the part of the corporate sector. Uh, if that can be brought about, uh, it could you know, uh, uh, address the kind of situation that you, you mentioned. So um, again, uh, uh, both monetary policy and structural reforms must be pursued in tandem. It is my key message today. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I'm afraid that it's 2 o'clock, and uh, at 2 o'clock, uh, everything here turns into a pumpkin, because our speaker has to leave. And can I want to, it's up to me to thank Mr. Nakasa can, can for... I, can uh, I just oh, one add more? add okay. one oh, word? Oh, right. uh, because this is something... <laughs> I was told to heard you out, but uh, yes. <laughs> Something that I had expected to be asked, uh, and prepared some sort of my, my, my uh, input to you, okay. because this is an important uh, question going forward. Uh, the question I was expecting is that whether, how far can you go uh, with regard to the negative rates? Um, I don't have the answer uh, yet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, we have introduced this uh, three-tier system, which alleviates uh, pressure on banks. And I didn't mention specifically in my remarks, but. Uh, um, if there's a leakage uh, from uh, uh, reserves to uh, cash, that would undermine the effectiveness yes. of negative rates. Uh, for that end, we have also uh, 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 introduced a mechanism that can charge negative rates on, 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 on banknotes uh, cash. If we think this is too excessive leakage from the reserves to banknotes uh, in circulation, we are able to uh, 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 charge negative rates. Uh, I, the Swiss have that too. Unfortunately, that only works if the cash stays with the banks. If they pass it to a non-bank intermediary, a big safe somewhere, then you can not charge mm -hmm. them. And so I think this is easily arbitraged. Yeah. Uh, nonetheless, it could, uh, it could uh, <laughs> kind of, you know, uh, uh, check at least. Um, one thing I, I wanted to say is that although I think it is therefore technically technically possible uh, to go farther down in the negative, uh, uh, my sense is that uh, for now uh, I would like to watch carefully how this um, new policy is going to work through the economy for example, including mm -hmm. the reasons you mentioned. Uh, for the time being, I think w I would like to, to watch how, how that's going to work through. That's my final comment. Thank you so much again for a wonderful presentation and discussion. Thank you very much.